Okay, hi everybody, hope uh, you're all well. And again, Mazel Tov uh, to Rabbi and uh, Rebetzin Poston. Uh, well, I guess I'll announce that as well. Now, the chasna they had last night, much, much Mazel and Bracha. Uh, today's shir is uh, dedicated uh, for a Rafur Shlema to Braya Bat Chava and Svi Ben Avraham. May they have a Rafur Shlema Betoch Shachole Yisrael. And uh, Aliyat Neshama of Avraham Ben Avraham. And, um, okay, so again, uh, may the learning be Le'ili Nishmato. And then we have another anonymous contribution uh, for tonight's class. And thank you, we really appreciate it. And another anonymous contribution as a Mazel Tov to the Poston family uh, for the wedding of uh, Yaakov Yinun to Shelley Argy. Uh, Argy? Argy? Argy. Argy. So, Be'ez Hashem, uh, they should be Zoha to have a Bayat Neman, Neman be Yisrael. Uh, we're uh, going with the Parsha of Chukas this week, and the Parsha of Chukas does have a very, very interesting mitzvah that is considered to be perhaps the most enigmatic uh, mitzvah in the Torah, and that is called the mitzvah of the Para Aduma. And again, halachically, to understand the Para Aduma, it is a ritual that is necessary to become purified from contact with a dead body. Uh, we've discussed before. Uh, that there is a concept in the Torah that when a person comes in contact with the dead, they are in a state of tuma, impurity. Now, impurity doesn't mean they're treif, they're not a Jew. For most purposes, a person can go on in regular life as a tame person. A person can go to show, a person can learn Torah, a person, uh, a man would put on tefillin, etc. But tuma does have disabilities connected to the Beis Hamikdash and the Harabayat and eating korbanos and eating truma. So uh, in the time of the temple in particular, it was a disadvantage to be connected to a uh, state of tuma. And the Torah gives us purification rituals to get out of the state of tuma. And for a mace, Tumas mace, which you contract by either touching a dead body, moving a dead body, or being under the same roof as a dead body, including a tree overhanging you and a grave. Uh, so the rituals are more complicated. Uh, you have to be sprinkled with the ashes uh, of the red heifer that are mixed with water, spring water and then a little bit is thrown on you on day three of your contamination and on day seven. And then after that, you go to the mikvah on day seven and you will be tahor at night. Okay, so if, for example, a person became tame on Monday, I'm picking Monday for a reason, so day three of their tuma is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday is day three. Uh, and then day seven is uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday is day seven. They get their second sprinkling on day seven. They go to the mikvah later that day. When nightfall comes, they become tar. Now, there are many, many different forms of tuma, and most of them do not require para duma. The outstanding example would be a woman that's a nida. It is in a state of tuma. We'll discuss what that means. And obviously, we know that a nida only needs immersion in a mikvah after the requisite number of days, there is no concept of para aduma. So para aduma is only for Tomas Mace contact with a dead body. And since we don't have para aduma today, anyone that ever came in contact with a dead body by being in a cemetery is tame, and there's no way to get out of it. That, that is... Or a huh? Most likely a hospital. Too. Or a hospital or something. And again, uh, we talked about harabayat and, and the implications of that. Uh, but but that, the issue is... All of us are Becheskas Tamemes. So the concept is that the ritual of Para Aduma is called a Chok. In fact, that's the Parsha, Chukas. Zos Chukas HaTorah. Uh, and a Chok is a law of the Torah for which there is no reason that we can figure out. Now, obviously, everything God does has a reason. But it's a Chok in the sense that it's beyond our comprehension. And this is said to be the Chok par excellence of the Torah, 
because it is so inexplicable in so many different ways. Why red? Why a heifer? Why ashes? Why water? Uh, Etc. We'll talk about some other paradoxes as, as we go on. Again, let me just clarify the obvious point that some people might not realize. Uh, the red of the para aduma is not fire engine red. If you had to have a fire engine red cow, uh, you would be very, very hard pressed to find it. That is not a color that appears in cattle naturally. The red of the para aduma is actually not an unusual color at all. It is the orange brown that is commonly the color of many types of cows, but the rarity of para aduma is it has to be virtually 100% that color. Uh, you're allowed to have up to one black hair. If there are two black hairs, how many hairs does a cow have? I don't know, five million? It's hard to know. But two black hairs, it's already disqualified. That means someone has to take a magnifying glass. Black or any other color? Any color, color, any color. Anything that's not, not that reddish brown. Uh, and someone has to go through every you know, millimeter of the para aduma. And of course, what happens is, even if you get one, it might change, right? It might, uh, a color might change and the like. So because of that, para adumas were rare. And uh, when they were needed, and when we had to find one at the time of the temple, uh, the person that had it uh, could often get a lot of money for a para aduma. That's a famous Gemara in Kedushin, uh, where the Gemara in Kedushin discusses kibbut of the aim, the mitzvah of honoring uh, parents, and it uses as the example of kibbut of the aim a non-Jew, Dama ben Nesina from Ashkelon, that one time the, uh, the Zikanim, the Sanhedrin, needed a precious stone in the Kohen Gadol's breastplate, and he was the only one that had that particular jewel, but the key to the jewelry case was under his father's head, and his father was taking a nap, and he would not wake up his father, even though he lost the sale of that jewel. They had to go elsewhere, and the Gemara records that God gave him a reward that the next year he had a para aduma in his flock and they were going to offer him even more money than they offered him for the jewel, but he said, I'll only take what you would have given me for the jewel. The story of Dabba bin Asin is halakhically a very interesting story because although the Talmud praises him for the tremendous respect he showed his father, one could raise a question of whether that was a sensible response. I mean, imagine that somebody comes and offers you millions and millions of dollars but you don't want to wake up your father because the key is there or the information is there. And then when dad wakes up, you say, you know, dad, I want you to know how much I honor you. I gave up $10 million not to wake you up from your nap. I mean, what would your father's reaction be? Uh, would he be honored and happy or would he be very, very upset? So it could very well be that Dhamma ben Nasina's action was not halakhically proper, but it came from a pure heart and therefore Chazal record the fact that he's considered to be a righteous Gentile because of his willingness to sacrifice on behalf of his, his father. Now, Paradum has many halachas that the Torah itself says. It's not just the color that's an issue. Uh, the issue is that uh, it, you could not have done any work with this cow. If you used it to draw a plow, it's no good. If you put a yoke on top of it, it's no good. Even if it was mated with a zachar, with a bull, that would disqualify it. Uh, you put your briefcase on top of it while you were getting something or something. It becomes puzzle. So a paraduma has to be watched very, 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 very carefully. Uh, the ritual is not connected to the temple per se. Uh, if you look in the Torah, you will find that the slaughtering and the burning of the paraduma is not on the altar. It's not in the temple. It's on the Mount of Olives. It's harazesim. Uh, and after it's prepared, the sprinkling with the water can be anywhere. It could be in Sfat, it could be in Tiberia. In fact, uh, the, the Mishnah tells us that supplies of the ashes were distributed in many places in the land of Israel. So when people were Tameh up north or in the south, they could go to regional purification centers. Right? So in many, many ways, there is almost nothing about the Para Aduma that is directly connected to the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, obviously, the Mount of Olives is near the Beit HaMikdash, but it's not the Harabayas itself. Uh, the preparation of the para is harazesim, and the sprinkling 
of the water and the ashes that occurs uh, wherever it is, uh, at least in Eretz Yisrael. In Chutz Laaretz, there would be halachic problems in even transporting the Parah Duma ashes to Chutz Laaretz, but at least anywhere in Eretz Yisrael is a kosher place for Hazaa. So, as it were, Chazal tell us that even Shlomo HaMelech, who seemingly understood every single part of the Torah, when it got to Parah Duma, he said, this is too much for me, I don't get it. So, the Mepharshim start off with a question that, that may be a small question, but it's, it has some interesting answers. And that is, uh, the, the Pasuk describes Paraduma with these three words, Zos Chukas HaTorah. This is the Chok of the Torah. Now, given the fact that we're only describing a specific Chok, we're not describing the whole Torah, why does it say Zos Chukas HaTorah, it should have said Zos Chukas HaPara. This is the Chok of the Para Aduma. Why say Zos Chukas HaTorah? So there are a number of answers uh, the Mephorshim give. The Arachayim gives a very interesting answer and he says that you find that the laws of impurity directly correlate to the level of Torah that a person has in the following way. Tuma represents the void that is created when holiness leaves the world. When holiness leaves the world, there is a vacuum, there is an emptiness, there is a void, and therefore that becomes impure, that becomes Tameh. Therefore, the higher and more elevated the holiness, the greater is the Tuma when there's an absence. So, for example, uh, a dead plant does not convey any impurity. If I touch a, a dead plant that's no longer growing, I don't become tummy. If I touch a dead animal that wasn't shechted, if it was shechted, that's not a problem. But if I touch a dead animal that was not shechted, kosher or non-kosher, I become tummy for one day. I don't need paraduma, but there's a tuma for one day. A dead human corpse, I'm tummy for seven days. You see, the greater the life, the greater the tuma. Plants have no tuma at all. Animals have limited tuma. The tuma of a human corpse is a much more severe tuma. And the tuma of a Jewish corpse is also a different level than the tuma of a non-Jewish corpse. The tuma of a non-Jewish corpse creates tuma by touching and by movement. But if I'm in the same room as a non-Jewish corpse called Ohel, I'm not tuma. But a Jewish corpse conveys Tuma even be Ohel, even under the same roof. So what you see is, you know, kind of a paradox a little bit. And that is, the greater the holiness, the greater the void and the vacuum and the emptiness that is created as a result of Tuma. So Tuma correlates, the Tuma of death correlates directly with the Kedusha of life. And that's what the Pasuk means, Zeis Chukas HaTorah. These laws, not just Paraduma, but the general laws of Tuma, are connected to the holiness of Torah that is within the framework of that individual. The plant is less than the animal, or, or the plant is, uh, or the animal is more than the plant, the person is more than the animal, the Jew is more than the non-Jew. All of that comes from the hierarchy of Zos Chukas HaTorah. That is Pshat number one that is said in the name of the Or HaChayim, or the Or HaChayim HaKadosh, uh, says it, Rav Chaim Ben Atar. Pshat number two is based on a very fascinating comment of the Vilna Gaon. All of us know the famous Chazal that Torah is compared to water. Torah is compared to water, and there are a million reasons why Torah is compared to water. Water purifies, Torah purifies, water is necessary for life, Torah is necessary for life. But the Vilna Gaon offers a startling reason why Torah is compared to water. He says it's the nature of water that whatever water is poured upon, water will facilitate growth. And the water is indifferent if the thing that it is stimulating is a positive or a negative. If I pour water on seeds, 
I'm going to get the growth of a plant, whether the plant is a rose bush, or whether it's poison ivy, or whatever it is. Water is matzmiach. Water causes growth, irrespective of whether that growth is positive or negative. So here's what the Vilna Gaon says, and this is really such an interesting, even controversial idea, that there have been places where I said this idea in a yeshivasha group, and they said it's impossible. The Vilna Gaon could not have said this. You'll see why in a moment. And the Vilna Gaon does say it, and he says the following. Tyra is like water, because Tyra will bring out in you whatever is there. So if you're a kind, compassionate, generous, humble person, the Torah will make you kinder, gentler, more compassionate, more humble. So far, no controversy there. But listen to this. This is where it's quite an amazing statement. If a person is arrogant, selfish, and overly connected to his ego, the learning of Torah might make him more so. That was the part that the Lakewood people didn't believe that the Vilna Gaon could have said. Now keep in mind, the Vilna Gaon was no slouch when it came to learning. You know, one could say if it would be a movement or whatever that wasn't Machshev Talmud Torah, you could so much, okay, you know, it comes from that side of it. The Vilna Gaon's whole life was learning Torah. The Vilna Gaon learned Torah 22 hours a day for, for more than 70 years. There was nothing in the Vilna Gaon that was as important as learning Torah. And still, the Vilna Gaon says, if you don't consciously work on your Midos Tovos, the learning of the Torah is not going to make you better. It may even make you worse. Torah is water. If you're competitive, your learning will just be another avenue in which you can be competitive and have one upmanship and the like. Now the truth is, this is actually quite a controversial idea and there are many contradictions in the Vilna Gaon's own writing. There are a number of places where the Vilna Gaon says that learning Torah itself will improve your character and make you better. I'm not going to deny you can find those passages. At least in this passage though he says, learning Torah alone can even make you worse unless you consciously work on your Midos Tovos. This is why it is said that the Vilna Gaon, in a sense, was the father of what later became known as the Musser movement. And you can even trace this in terms of uh, Talmud and Rebbe, because the Vilna Gaon's Talmud, Mufak, his uh, closest Talmud, was Rav Chaim of Volozhin. And Rav Chaim of of course, started the famous Volozhiner Yeshiva, and uh, one of his Talmidim was Rav Zundel of Salant, from the city of Salant. And Rav Zundel of Salant was a very, very hidden tzaddik, very hidden. He did not have yeshiva, he did not have position, but his disciple was Rav Yisrael Salanter, who started this emphasis on Musar. And in a way, there was a Messira going back to the Vilna Gaon, that one has to consciously work on their midos. This was a controversy when Rav Yisrael Salanter started. There were a number of yeshivas that were against any concentration on Musar because they said Torah learning is enough. And uh, Volozhin itself did not uh, have uh, incorporate Musar in their, in their curriculum. Uh, Brisk, was, uh, Brisk was and to some degree is uh, against the, the concept of a formalized emphasis on Musar. So it's still kind of a live controversy. Is Torah enough? The Chavitz Chaim later described it that Torah is the ideal diet for a healthy soul. If you're a healthy soul, the Torah will keep you healthy and make you stronger. But if you have sicknesses of the soul, you need some extra medicines, you need some extra therapies. Uh, the Torah will not itself help you. You need to augment with Musar and working on your Midos and, and the like. So this is a famous comment of the Vilna Gaon. So why is it connected to Paradium? Which this, I, this the Vilna Gaon does not say, but this is my extension of it. We say Paradium is a chok. Well, what's so chok about it? What's so mysterious? Is it just a red cow? So the Meforshim actually say, what is really inexplicable about the Paraduma 
is not merely the myriad of details that don't make sense. I mean, there are many things in the Torah that I don't, can, cannot make sense of. But the problem of the Paraduma is a paradox and a contradiction that is built into the mitzvah. And that is the following. The para aduma purifies those who are tummy. But everybody who handles the ashes becomes tummy. Now that's, right, this is the famous phrase, mitaher esatmeim. It purifies those who are impure. Umitame esatahorim. And it can take somebody that's pure and make him tummy. Now, I just want to clarify again, this is, this is obvious, but some people might not realize this. People ask the question, if that's the case, how is it ever possible for all of the Jewish people to be ritually purified? Won't there always be somebody who's holding the bag, so to speak? Because here's the thing. Let's imagine I have a lot of people who are Tamei Mace. So I'm a Kohen, so I sprinkle on you. But now I'm tummy because I handle the ashes of the paraduma. So I need somebody to sprinkle on me. And assuming I have the requisite days. So now I'm pure, but he's tummy. So somebody sprinkles on him. So he's tar, somebody else is tummy. How are you going to get everybody to be tar if the people who handle the ashes of the paraduma? are always going to be tummy. You have uh, what's called an infinite regression problem in which no matter how many times you go through it, there'll be somebody that's going to be tummy. The answer is that's not a problem. And one reason it's not a problem, there are a few reasons why it's not a problem, but one reason why it's not a problem is the person who becomes tummy because he handles the ashes of para aduma does not need to be sprinkled with the ashes of para aduma. The only tuma that needs to be sprinkled with the ashes of para aduma is the tuma of mace, touching a corpse or moving a corpse. If I'm tame because I'm dealing with the ashes of para aduma, all I have to do is go to the mikvah. So whatever it is. So after I sprinkle everybody, I'm tame, yeah, that's true. I go to the mikvah, I'll be tar at night. Right, so there's no problem. You would only have an infinite regression if every person needs to be sprinkled with the ashes of the paraduma. That's not the case. Now, a second reason, I say this because I don't want to get an email telling me I, whatever. Uh, the second reason uh, is that as a matter of fact, although it is true that the people who handle the ashes of paraduma do become tame, that does not apply to the one who sprinkles uh, the ashes. In other words, that person, Bechlau, does not become Tame, so you don't have to write me that, that Rashi says that, I'm aware of that. Uh, so those would be two reasons why there wouldn't be uh, an infinite regression problem. Yeah. People are involved in well, there's plenty of people. There are people who have to gather the ashes, they transport the ashes. Uh, right? So all of those people do become Tame for only one day, only one day, and they have to go to the mikvah. So Chazal say that the paradox of Paraduma is not only the inexplicable nature of the red heifer and everything else, but it's connected to the contradiction that how can the same thing that generates purity generate impurity? But that's exactly the paradox of the Torah, right? If you have good midos, the Torah makes you better. If you have bad midos, the Torah makes you worse. So Zos Chukas HaTorah says the same chok, the same paradox you have in Paraduma, you also have in the Torah itself. In other words, Metaher es Atmeim, Metameh es Atahorim. As I say, this is a, a controversial teaching of the Vilna Gaon, but it does highlight the idea that we have to be consciously working on midos tovos, uh, improving our character, because the process of learning alone is not, going to, is not going to do that. Now, a third answer to the question, why does it say this is the chok of the Torah rather than this is the chok of the, of the para, uh, is the idea that a person's attitude to the Torah can be measured and gauged 
by how they deal with the chok. A lot of the Torah makes sense. So if I keep the parts of the Torah that are sensible to me, is that because I'm following the will of God? Or am I simply doing what is logical and sensible to me? So how do you know? How does a person know if I'm truly committed to Hashem? It's primarily through the chukim. Because the chukim involve a suspension of your rational belief. Makes no sense. You're only doing it because of Hashem. Now, once you show that your loyalty to Hashem is not limited by your reasoning, then even the mitzvahs you do that make sense now become service to Hashem rather than serving yourself. So those chukah satora, the way you keep the chok is your attitude to the Torah as a whole. That it's a matter of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Far too often, and you know, I could say this is what the conservative reform did, but the truth is even, even in the orthodox world we, we do this as well, so I don't, I don't want to single that out. We kind of have a preconceived notion of what we want. And then we look in the Torah and we cherry pick different sources to support what it is that we want to do. Well, the issue about Roe versus Wade in, in recent days is an example where all, all of a sudden different people are finding all of these sources in the Torah that support the right to an abortion. Which is, you know, pretty bizarre. But you say, the, the Torah supports the right to choose. Or because it says in Genesis, it is not good for man to be alone and that is what God decreed. So the Torah must support gay marriage. Okay, I don't want to discuss these hot button issues because again, I, I, I have compassion for everybody that's involved in either the struggle of an unwanted pregnancy or the issue of same-sex attraction. I, I, I don't mean to denigrate, but there's a certain mental process in which I want to come to a certain result and then I'm going to find in the Torah that result. That is using the Torah to advance your agenda rather than nullifying yourself to God's will, even if it's not. Now again, as I say, I mean, even in the Orthodox world, this type of thing is done, and maybe it's human nature. But the chok is the example of unconditional obedience, even when it doesn't make sense, and that exemplifies a person's whole attitude towards the Torah. Zos chukas ha-Torah. So now, let's talk a little bit about another idea that Rashi brings. Rashi quotes, usually most of Rashi's uh, sources are Midrashim, Gemaras, right? That's, that's the raw material out of which Rashi constructs his commentary. Rashi almost never quotes like later authorities that are after the time of the Midrash. But here he does. He quotes an authority in the generation before Rashi, but after the Talmud and the Medrash, Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan, Rabbi Moshe the preacher. And it's interesting, where did Rashi get this? Because we, we, we don't really have a book of Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan. Rashi apparently did have access to a sefer authored by Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan, and it's one of many svarim that sometimes we've lost and have not come down to us. It's very quite amazing. Uh, there are many, many farms that are lost, and um, even uh, non sifre Kodesh were lost. For example, Aristotle. This is kind of a very amazing thing, just as a little aside. Aristotle had two different, totally, groups of works. One was called exoteric, meaning easy to understand, intended for a popular audience, kind of, you know, philosophy for dummies, whatever it would be, in which everything was explained absolutely clear. And then there is what were called the esoteric works of Aristotle that were like his footnotes, his eon, his in-depth study that is much more difficult to understand and almost th they were personal notes, his own notes uh, that were not even intended for the public. For some crazy reason, I don't even understand the process, it is only the esoteric works that survived. None of Aristotle's exoteric works survived. You would think the opposite. You would think the part that was popular and everybody got to appreciate. But Dafka, that would have been that which would be available. We have no trace of it at all. I mean, we, we have testimonies that it existed. Not here. 
I mean, imagine to have Aristotle, you know, in like clear, clear shot, you know, that would have been a, a great thing in many ways. But what's even a much greater Aveda than not having Aristotle is that we've lost Midrashim and we've lost Chazals and uh, even from the time of Chazal and we've lost Rav Moshe Hadarshan. But Rashi does bring for Rav Moshe Hadarshan an interesting idea that the para aduma is a kapara, is an atonement for the chet egel, for the sin of the golden calf. Right, the sin of the golden calf was a form of idolatry that the Jewish people practiced. It was a great avera, even though it was formally forgiven on Yom Kippur. But there's a certain stigma, a certain trace of the sin of the golden calf that is still with us to this very day. And the ritual of the para aduma is a kapara for the chedo egel. And the analogy would be that if a baby comes into a house and a baby messes up the house, the mother must come and clean up after the baby. So too, the calf which messed up, the mother, the para, the cow, must come and wipe up the filth that the baby generated. Right? Tavo ha'em usachaper al havulat. So let's explore this. In what way would the para aduma be a kapara for the chedego? First of all, how can you call it a kapara? It's not in the Beis HaMikdash. It's not a sacrifice. And it's not brought, the Torah does not describe the para aduma as an atonement for sin. The Torah describes the para aduma as a purifier from Tumas Meis. It's a different function. It's not a kapara function. It is a tahara function. It is a function of a purification ritual. So to understand this a little bit, let's go back to the general idea of tuma. Now as I say, there are many, many forms of tuma in the Torah. But Rav Shemshar Falher says, the common form of Tuma, all Tuma is derived from connection to death. Now, in some cases, this is absolutely obvious. I touch a dead body, I'm Tume. I touch a dead animal, I'm Tume. Obviously, that's connected to death. But even forms of Tuma, which are not directly connected to death, are indirectly connected. A Nida. A Nida has a status of Tume. Why? Where's the death? Because the shedding of the uterine lining is a potential life that could have been created in that month that was not. A leper, a metzora, when they, we had saras, is treated as a connection to death because the skin is rotting away, etc. A man that has a seminal emission is tame. You don't need paraduma, but it is tame. Because a seminal emission is also, in a sense, a form of wasting seed that could have gone for reproduction. Now, even a woman who gives birth to a child is in a state of tuma. Hmm, why would childbirth be connected to death? It's the opposite. She brought a new life into the world. So there are actually two reasons. One is because Every childbirth, I don't want to scare anyone, but every childbirth is a near-death experience. It is pikuach nefesh. So in a sense, there is a brush with death. And number two, which is more of an abstract idea, Rav Hirsch says, childbirth, as strange as this may sound, is the death of a life that was within the woman's body. There was a life within her body. Now the life has been externalized. But in a sense, there is a void within. There is actually a void and an emptiness within that she is no longer carrying life. So Rav Hirsch's point is, all tuma of all types, not just actual corpse tuma, all tuma is based on a connection with death. Why does death cause tuma? Because, in a sense, death came into the world by virtue of the chait of Adam and Chava eating from the Eitz Adas. Hashem's original plan was we would live forever. Eating from the Eitz Adas brought death into the world. So every single time we encounter death, 
we get re-expelled from the Garden of Eden. Because death is connected to the chait of the Eitz Hadas. And the chait of the Eitz Hadas creates expulsion from Gan Eden. When I get connected to death, I'm reconnecting to the chait of the Eitz Hadas. And I get expelled. Now what is Gan Eden on earth? Gan Eden on earth is the Beis HaMikdash. That is why the laws of Tumah don't apply in most areas of life, as I said at the beginning. A person who's Tomei, by any reason, can learn, can daven, can go to Shul. That's not a problem. We go around our lives being Tomei and there's no problem that we have per se. But you can't go to the Beis HaMikdash. You have to suffer the consequences of expulsion from Gan Eden because death connects me to the chait of Adam HaRishain and Chava, the eating of the Eitz Hadas. Now what was the root of that chait? And this we spoke about a few weeks ago. The root of the chait of the Eitz Hadas, Rav Sadak writes, was covet, honor, glory, ego, gratification. Because how did the Nachash entice Chava to eat from the fruit? He had two strategies. One was, she was told by Adam not to touch the tree because the day that you touch the tree uh, you will die and that was a distortion because Hashem didn't say don't touch the tree. Hashem said don't eat the fruit. But Adam didn't trust his wife and he told her don't even touch it. And the Nachash pushed her against the tree and she touched it and nothing happened. And uh, Chava concluded that this commandment is not relevant. That's where Chazal say be careful not to add to the Torah because if you add to the Torah you'll come to diminish it. That was strategy number one. But strategy number two is the Nachash marketed the fruit of the Eitz Hadas as a God pill. <coughs> the Nachash said, the day that you eat from this fruit, you will be like God in total mastery of good and evil, understanding the nature of good and evil. Whatever that was, imagine somebody comes to you and says, take this pill and you can be Hashem. That's the ultimate ego trip. The Merida, the rebellion against God in the chait of the Eitz Hadas, came from arrogance, came from gaiva, came from kavait. And that's very significant because in many, many ways we are godlike. We are created in the image of God. Salam alukim. And that has concrete meanings. There are many, many dimensions in being created in the image of God. It doesn't mean a physical image. God does not have eyes, ears, nose. But it means there are attributes of the human personality that are divine attributes. Among them are creativity, initiative. We are given wisdom, understanding, a certain control over the world. In fact, Ralph Soloveitchik used to write about the idea that draining the swamps and conquering disease, trying to, trying to do it, is a religious mandate. Because that is one of the ways we exemplify being in the image of God. To kind of take charge of the world in various ways. So we are godly. And of course in holiness, certainly so. But the problem is that could easily slide into arrogance. That can easily slide into a sense as the Torah warns us over and over again of kochi v'yotzim yadi. When a person says, it is my strength and my ability that accomplishes everything. That's why we've learned over the past few years that in spite of all of our systems and all of our technology and all of our mastery, things can make everything fall apart very, very quickly. I mean, the whole experience of COVID, whatever your particular take on it, is something that's very, very humbling. It just shows us how the whole world can come to a standstill. 
and in the United States, other things, uh, the disintegration of society, the uh, Black Lives Matter, and the um, defunding the police, all sorts of mishugas that, that one would never imagine. But all of these things, you know, go on. And the world is kind of gets out of control. And when it spins out of control, we realize that we are not the masters of our fate. That we often think that we are. So death could be seen not so much as a punishment by God, but as a reminder that we are not God. Meaning there is a chasm. There is a gap between creator and created. We have so many godly attributes, but we're not God. We don't live forever. We die. So this is all built on Rav Hirsch's idea that all Tuma is connected to death. Death is connected to the sin of the Garden of Eden. That requires expulsion from the Garden of, uh, from the Garden of Eden, which is the Beis Hamikdash. And it is connected ultimately to arrogance, gaiva, pomposity, thinking we are masters of our fate, and it is death that ultimately reminds us that we are not. Now this explains yet another feature, and you'll see how this will link up to Paraduma. This explains why if death comes into the world because of arrogance, why the purification rituals that liberate us from death are rituals of humility and modesty. What are the two rituals that Tumas Mace, let's take Tumas Mace as, as the highest Tuma. Number one, the ashes of Paraduma. And number two, immersion in a mikvah. And those are the two rituals that a person needs. Mikvah we still have today, Paraduma we don't. Ashes is said to be the great symbol of humility. When Avram Avinu prays for the cities of Sodom and Amorah, and Avram Avinu declares that he's really not worthy, he says, Anochi afor va'efer. I am dust. I am ashes. Mikvah in which you actually put yourself in the vulnerable environment of water. You put yourself in an environment where unless you're Aquaman, you will not be able to survive, right? I, I put myself underwater. Yeah, I put it for a second. Granted, that's fine. But I'm in an environment where I have no capacity of living, right? If I stay there for 15 minutes or a half an hour, whatever it is, I'm gone. And that's why, indeed, the mikveh is treated as a birthing experience. You put yourself back in the amniotic fluid and you reemerge as a new person. Both of those rituals is shedding the ego, obliterating the arrogance, achieving humility and recreation. So, you see the correlation here. If death comes into the world because of arrogance, Gaiva and ego. I and therefore I am re-expelled from Gan Eden. I get purified and readmitted by humility, modesty, and submission. And that is the idea of the ashes. Now that doesn't explain why a cow, why red. I'm not explaining all the details. But the notion that purification is connected to ashes. Because that's the antidote. That is the refua for the chait that brought Tuma into the world in the first place. Okay? I, death came because of gaiva. I am liberated from death by humility. And this is the great mushal. I mean, many people know it from Greek mythology, the phoenix bird. But the truth is we have it in our own midrashim, a bird called the, ne called the ziz. And this is a bird, right, in the Phoenix myth, which people know, a bird gets burnt into ashes and it rises from the ashes. And Chazal have an, an identical midrash. The met, now, whether literally there is such a bird is not really important. Many midrashim are speaking allegorically. But the symbolic meaning of this is a very powerful one. And that is, it is precisely 
by obliterating our ego and our arrogance that we achieve immortality and new life. Like you might think the opposite. If I kind of destroy my ego, I, I'm not here. The other way around. That is how you get empowered. That is how you get recreated. You rise from the ashes. So with this idea, Rav Sadok, the Svas Emes, suggest that we might even have an understanding of the paradox of Paradu. And now again, obviously we have to be very careful here. If even Shlomo HaMelech doesn't understand the Paraduma, then obviously we're not going to be totally successful. But still, the Sfarim want to offer a little bit of insight. Again, what is the paradox of Paraduma? It purifies the impure, meaning it creates purity, but it also generates impurity. How can the same thing have two opposite effects? If we understand that the symbolic meaning of ashes is humility and submission and obliteration of the ego, then the suggestion of the para aduma is there is what you might call good humility, which purifies and liberates, and then there is destructive humility that destroys and contaminates. The same type of character um, idea can move you in opposite ways. The humility that says, I'm nothing without God and I have to link myself to God. That's a wonderful thing. That's kind of connecting to the ultimate power source that empowers you, that liberates you, that strengthens you, that gives you courage. Because you know that you're not in charge. You just do your best and Hashem will help you. That's the humility that purifies. But there's another humility in which because I think I'm nothing, why should I bother to do good in the world? Whatever I do doesn't make a difference. A lack of self-esteem. A lack of recognizing your potential. A lack of knowing that you have a power to do good in the world. So the remez is there are ashes of empowerment and transcendence and spirituality which make you pure and there are ashes of paralysis, self-doubt, worthlessness and hopelessness that make you impure. That's the remnant. On one hand, humility is the greatest of all qualities. On the other hand, when it engenders within a person a sense of worthlessness and despair, it actually becomes the Yetzer Hara. It is a Yetzer Hara coming in the guise of something religious. I'm such a tzaddik because I'm so humble, whatever it would be. Humility can be very, very destructive. A person has to know their worth. A person has to know their value. That is why para aduma, which purifies by virtue of the humility, can also convey tuma. With this introduction, let's segue back to Rav Moshe Hadarshan, which was a question I raised and didn't answer. Rav Moshe Hadarshan writes that para aduma is a kapara, is an atonement for the sin of the golden calf. And the question is, how is it an atonement for that? I mean, is it just because mother cleans up after the baby? But what thematically is the kapara? So let's remember the sin of the golden calf itself. Ramban and Kuzari both explain that the sin of the golden calf was not Avedizara. They, they didn't think that this calf that they just made was the God that took them out of Egypt and created heaven and earth. It's very clear from the Torah that the Jewish people looked at the Egel not as a substitute for God, but as a substitute for Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe was late. They need something that spiritually will be an intermediary, we don't understand that process, of Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? Because they felt we are not worthy 
of having a relationship with God without an intermediary force. We are too insignificant. We are too sinful. We are too lowly to dare to approach the Almighty. We needed Moshe Rabbeinu as an intermediary. And now that he's gone, we need the golden calf. Again, this is a process we don't understand, but the Ramban explains how the ego was seen as a spiritual channeler of divine energy. So in a sense, the chait of the golden calf, the chait of the ego, was a displaced modesty in which you don't realize how beloved you are in Hashem's eyes. You don't realize your worth. It's not so much a rebellion against Hashem as it is a failure to understand who you are. A failure to understand that you can and therefore must have a relationship with God. That was the Chet Ego. Rav Sadok writes, and I've said this uh, more than once, just as a person is chayev to have emunah in Hashem, they must have emunah in themselves. The Chet Ego was a failure to have emuna in themselves. Now, here is the thing. Para Aduma is a purification ritual that involves humility. Humility, ashes. But what does it do? It purifies me so I can go into the Beis HaMikdash. So in a sense, what I'm doing is I'm taking the same attribute of humility which was used in a destructive way for the Chet Ego to say I'm not worthy of connecting to God and I'm taking that same humility and using it in a positive way to have that connection. Now the Rambam writes what is the ideal of repentance? How does a person know that they've truly repented? When they put themselves in the same situation well, I, I shouldn't say put themselves. You're not, actually, you're not allowed to put yourself. But if I find myself in the same situation that caused me to sin, and instead of sinning, I don't. For example, a person was in a certain bar or a certain city and he used nichshol and alcohol or other things. So he's not supposed to put himself in the same situation because how do you know? Right? So for sure, don't do it. But if you find yourself in the same situation and you're, you don't sin, then Baruch Hashem, that shows you've truly changed. So that's exactly what's going on here. The humility that generated the ego is now being used to generate a participation in the avoda of the Beis HaMikdash. You've taken that humility and you've converted it from a negative destructive force to a positive, constructive one. That's tshuva. That's what Rav Moshe Darshan means when he says, the para aduma is a kapara for the chayt ego. Because if I didn't believe I was worthy of going to the Beis HaMikdash, why would I bother being sprinkled with the para aduma, right? I don't, I don't need it. El I want to go to the Beis HaMikdash, right? I'm not going to say I'm unworthy. Right, so that's the idea of, of, of Kapara. Let me just end with one, uh, one final thought. And that is, there are certain Midrashim that are actually called Medrash Paliya. Uh, midrashim that are unknown, meaning their meaning is so uh, elusive that they're just called difficult Midrashim. So there's a Medrash Paliya that says, if you want to understand para aduma, you must understand avat Yisrael. The secret of para aduma is the love of one Jew for another. And the question becomes, you know, it's hard to see the connection there. So here is what one of the Hasidic Rebbe says. He says, you know, if all the people who handle the para aduma become tummy. If you're a Kohen, that's a major inconvenience. Because Kohanim are supposed to work in the Beis HaMikdash and this kind of disqualifies them. They get supported on the basis of truma. 
and a coin that's tummy cannot eat truma. So really, any tuma that a Kohen incurs is going to be an inconvenience and a detriment to him. But why is the Kohen doing it? To enable another Jew to become pure. That's a selfless act of paraduma. So based on this, here's the idea. Instead of looking at it as a paradox, it makes people pure and it makes people impure. It's actually a reason because it makes me impure. That is the secret of its power to purify because by being willing to make myself impure, I am inconveniencing myself for a fellow Jew. The willingness to inconvenience myself brings purity into the world. So you see the Chiddush here. In other words, instead of saying, oh, it's a contradiction. It's metame some people and metare other people. No, because it's metame me and I'm willing to do it, that is the source of its power of purity into the world. Avas Yisrael. When a Jew cares for another Jew, that changes the world. You know, they tell an old, an old Hasidic story about a child who was learning how to read and, uh, you know, Hashem's name is often printed in Sidurim as two Yuds. And we pronounce it as Aleph Dalid Nun. Uh, we pronounce it as Hashem's name. So the child was told, whenever you see these two Yuds, you pronounce it as Hashem's name. Now, if you look in a printed Chumash, at the end of a Pusuk, when you have like a colon, it looks like a Yud on top of a Yud a little bit. So the child, when he came to the end of the Pusuk, he read Hashem's name. So the Rebbe said, no, no, no. Uh, this is just uh, a period. This is not anything. So the kid asked, how come uh, when I had the Yud and the Yud before, it was Hashem's name, and now it's just a period? So he said, this is a pun, the letter Yud is the same as the Yiddish for a Yid. Yud, Yid. He says, when you have two Yidden standing next to each other, helping each other, considering themselves equal, that's when God resides. Hashem is there. But when one, one Yud is on top of another Yud, looking down at the person, that's the end of the Pasuk. The Torah cannot go any further with that type of attitude. A Yid next to a Yid is the Shechina. A Yid on top of a Yid, the Torah stops. It does not proceed. You know, we're entering uh, the month of Tammuz uh, this week. And uh, Tammuz... Uh, the 17th of Tammuz, we'll be talking about it obviously, is the beginning of the three weeks where we mourn and we think about the Beis HaMikdash. And this is surely one of the things we have to contemplate. As well, in the beginning of the month, as uh, the 3rd of Tammuz, uh, the yard site of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Zechot uh, Tzadik V'Kadosh Levracha. And, uh, you know, whatever one's view on the different controversial issues within Chabad, there is no, no question that the Rebbe was, was great and holy and uh, Gadol and Torah, but uh, especially great in Avas Yisrael, devoted his life to connect to every single Jew. And as we uh, come to his yard site, we should try to emulate his ways to whatever degree that we can. And in that way, each and every one of us can be Makarev, the Geula Shlema, B'mheira V'yameinu. Thank you and have a good Shabbos. Good Chodesh. Yes, you're